When the things you seek have been lost to time, look no further. We can go get them. We're Murphy's Inc. Murphy's Inc. is not responsible for any time paradoxes, historical retaliations, or other risks related to the delivered artifact. Any questions regarding the company's liability or tax information will be answered in time. Previously on Murphy's Inc., after Michael was caught dancing with a man's wife, he found himself getting into a bit of a fight. Luckily, he was no worse for wear and was able to continue the mission, only to find himself and Daphne having arrows shot at them. Of course, they had just befriended the Protestant reformer, Martin Booser, who ended up catching one of those arrows in the leg. Hart and James had thought that they'd been kidnapped, only to find out that they were being protected by a seemingly familial figure in Xavier du Hart. Bruno pledged his allegiance to Sebastian to track down Michael and his followers. Unfortunately, it turned out that Sebastian would no longer require Bruno's assistance, so his dancing wife was put to death. Back at HQ, the Librarian and Stephanie continued to conduct research into the plague affecting the city of Strasbourg, as well as the necklace Isaac as requested. Isaac and Gleason seemed to be a bit at odds, and the Shadow Squad made the jump to meet up with Murphy sometime in England. Historical figure file number 67000FR, Xavier Duhart. Charming, brave, yet mysterious, Xavier lives with a giant chip on his shoulder. Constantly having something to prove, Xavier is always on edge. His parents died young, leaving him in the care of a ruthless, sinister man, who no doubt affected the man he became. Regardless, being born and raised in 1500 Strasbourg, France, can harden a person and cause them to lie and distrust those around them in order to survive. No one understands this concept as Xavier does. What did you do? Isn't it a little bit early for you to be screwing something up? I haven't done anything. I came in here this morning and the machine was making all this noise. This isn't even half as bad as it was earlier. Well, I came to see you because I wanted to know why you would approve of Isaac taking additional clothes out of my reserve. I have no idea what you're talking about. And frankly, right now is not the time. I'm sorry, please, but at least five of my finest outfits, some men's and some women's, circa the early 19th century, have disappeared, and I would like to know why. Billy, I don't know anything about this. However, I have a meeting with Isaac later today, and we'll ask him all about your clothes. Now please, leave me to figure out what is wrong with this infernal machine. I said, who goes there? <gasps> Brian, Friar Martin? Oh my, uh, what has happened? Here, help me get him on the table. Un, two, trois. Will you be able to save him? It's hard to say, though it will be determined by the severity of his wound. If you would be so kind, Monsieur, hand me my instruments and assist me. Madame, if you will take that rag over there and dab it across his forehead. Yes, Doctor. Of course, whatever you need. Now, Friar, if you would, bite down on this piece of leather strap, please. Thank you for calling Murphy's Incorporated. This is Isaac. Isaac, we're on location, and Murphy is nowhere to be found. Did you give me the right location? Your coordinates are correct. However, the chief will no longer be meeting you at this location. It would have been nice if 
you to tell us this earlier. We've been sitting here for three hours. The decision was not mine. Your itinerary was slightly altered to maximize efficiency. It is almost time for you to get your boarding passes. Boarding passes? Where are we going now? You will be traveling to New York by ship. You will have a little over four days to find and secure the Eye of Norn. Where is our new rendezvous location? You will travel 12 and 3 quarters kilometers south-southeast and meet at the White Star Line dock. Um, what vessel will we be boarding? The Titanic. The Titanic? Are you insane? First you must find the Eye. If you complete your mission early, you'll be free to enjoy the rest of your time there as if it is a vacation. Just be sure to come back before 2 in the morning, otherwise it may be too late. What kind of joke is this? I swear, Isaac, if you're messing with me... I suggest you focus on your mission rather than idle threats. You and the chief will be monitoring the others from first class. Three of your agents will be in second class. Another two will infiltrate the crew. I'm serious, Isaac. Don't play with me. I need to know what the exit strategy is. I do not play games, Shadow Leader. If you have any other queries, please refer them to... Hello, sleepyhead. Have a nice nap? (laughs) Where am I? We took you to the physician's house as you asked. He removed the arrow from your leg. Bless you. You've lost much blood, so you may be frail for the next few days, but the surgery proved successful. Thank goodness your friends here brought you in when they did. Otherwise, I... The bogus men would have finally succeeded in my demise. You seem to know who shot you. Of course. Why would their men want to kill you? Because my teachings are a threat to not only the Burgess power, but that of their Catholic Church as well. Their men are ordered to watch over me whenever I hold meetings at the tavern, which they stake out behind. Should I ever exit the establishment from the back and enter into their sights, they had the fire upon me. I'm so sorry, Air Booser. If I had known, I would never have forced you to come with us. You mustn't trouble yourself over it. It was bound to happen sooner or rather than later. I can promise you that. Martin? Martin, are you okay? (laughs) It would appear he needs more rest. (laughs) Forgive me, Doctor, but in our haste we forgot to properly introduce ourselves. We are theologians from abroad. We met Herr Booster at the tavern across the street from the town square. I'm Michael, and this is my wife, Daphne. Ah, la glorie suprema. I have only fond memories. Well, it's nice to meet you both. I am Dr. Jacques Monet. Please, have a seat and tell me what brings you to the great city of Strasbourg. Monsieur, this is the best fish I've ever tasted. Have you never had fish cooked over a fire before? No, this is the first time. Hmm. I kind of wish I had tried it back when my dad and I went on fishing trips when I was younger. <laughs> uh, is something the matter? Uh, did I say something wrong? No, no, you did nothing wrong. Uh, you two are so comical is all. The way you talk. It's as though you came from another time entirely. <laughs> Isn't that noticeable? Stop talking. Dear gods, forgive me. I didn't mean to imply you are actually wooler or any nonsense like that. So you don't think we're wooler? You two? 
<laughs> Not even close. If you were, then Josephine would have conjured a string of fish instead of catching them, wouldn't she? And you, good man, would have blinked and set that tent up, rather than spending nearly half the night putting it up. Right. Yeah. Well, I don't know about you two, but I'm turning in. Good night. See you on tomorrow. Bright and early, good man. It's so peaceful here. Quiet. Even in the city. Mm, that's one way to put it. Is this tranquil where you are from, Josephine? Not even close. But it's my home, regardless of how good or bad it gets. Xavier, would you mind if I asked you a question? Sure, go ahead. Your stationery, the plates, and the silverware with your family seal. Where did you get it? I, I mean you no offense, but I've never heard of a peasant farmer owning such fine specimens. You are very astute, madame. I knew one day someone like you would catch on. You are right. It is abnormal for a person of my status to have such finery in his possession. For your sake. All I can tell you is they were a gift. <laughs> and that's how we ended up here. Incredible. Mm -hmm. You're fortunate uh, you escaped without contracting the dancing fever yourselves. The fever? Has it been hard on you as a physician? It is uh, nothing new. There have been epidemics such as these in the past, and I am confident there will be more in the future. Strasbourg has experienced these before. Records from 1364 and 1463 told of severe outbreaks of dancing mania wherein people displayed similar symptoms. But this, hmm, this is different. How so? We live in a time of great tribulation, turmoil, and strife in almost all aspects of life. Whether it be violence in the streets, division over religious leanings, a recent great pox epidemic, grain shortages, or the iron fist of the burghers' rule, our people cannot seem to free their minds of it. Thus, I've come to the painful conclusion that there will never be a remedy. The cathedral is the other way, Your Grace. Why are we here? Patience. I need to make a short visit. I won't be long. Just a moment. What can I do? Oh, it's you. Hello, Greta. Why have you come here, Sebastian? Looking to take more taxes from me? Come now, why do you think so little of me? Because you are a snake in the grass and you are not to be trusted. Once more, why are you in my house? My sweet, I think you know why I'm here. I am not your sweet, and please remove your hand from my face. As you wish. What a lovely home you and your brother have. Do you recall what I have done for you and your brother? Hmm? The strings I have had to pull for you, the help I have given you, keeping you from public scrutiny and Xavier out of trouble. Yes, and I also recall how you took advantage of me and threatened my and Xavier's lives if we dared to publicize it. How you ordered your guards to whip Xavier across his back until he bled, because he spoke out against you and the burghers in a town hall meeting. I remember it all, Sebastian. Every last detail of how you have made our lives a living hell since you first entered it. My kindness and patience are wearing very thin. I've told you, my... No, Sebastian, don't you dare. I know your brother harbored Waller in this house. 
and is now on the run with them to the cathedral. If I were you, I would be on my hands and knees, praying that he's able to weasel his way out of Strasbourg before my men find him, because when they do, he'll be tortured and then hanged. Once that happens, our agreement will be null and void, and I will return to collect what is mine. Thank you, Dr. Monet. We will never forget what you have done for us, or for Herr Boozer. I second that notion. Thank you again, Doctor, for everything. Ah, glad to help. It does my heart good knowing, and I am certain the friar feels the same, that there are still good-hearted people left in this cruel world who seek to help others and not destroy them. I, I do concur indeed. Herr Martin, so good to see you awake. How did you sleep last night? Are you feeling any better? Let the man breathe for a bit, will you, Death? Considering the circumstances, I slept peacefully, and I am still quite sore, but I am on the mend. So long as you stay off that leg until I direct you otherwise. But of course. Herr Michael, if I could speak with you privately for a moment before you leave... Yeah, okay, sure. I was unable to tell you this at the tavern, but I knew that I had to before you left. People often misconstrue my purpose for leaving the Catholic Church and becoming a reformer. They see me as a radical, not a liberator. I preached on charity, chastity, and obedience towards God. However, I did so on the streets of Strasbourg, not confined within the perimeters of the church. The crowds would gather at the square to hear me preach of these things, and would pay graciously to the church for me doing so. Then I heard a man speak against everything I thought was true and just. And that man was Martin Luther? Correct. But don't misunderstand what I am telling you. I do not hate Catholics. It is only my heart's desire for them to see the truth as I did, and for them to take that truth and deliver it to the masses for the common good, which is to say, I want to give you this. It's called the gift from the beyond. This was the necklace I wore when I was a monk. The idea was that if you wore the necklace while at the altar, the Holy Spirit would be summoned, which I now recognize to be false. There is another just like it in circulation that I had made in the event anything should happen to this one. The duplicate. Do you know where it is? Unfortunately, no. I had been in the market a few days ago, praying over those afflicted with the dancing mania, and someone stole it from my satchel. Do you have any idea why they stole it from you? I have a reason in mind, yes. The back of the necklace opens up, see, and nestled in the pocket is a vial of blood. Extraordinary. What's the story behind it? Uh, it's a rather long one. And I'm afraid you won't have much time for me to tell it. But I can tell you this. The blood is that of a martyr named Saint Vitus. And it supposedly contains healing powers. And the duplicate, does it contain the blood as well? No. Which is why I think the thief knew about the necklace and myself and thought I had the real one in my possession at the market. They needed the necklace. But why? I don't claim to know all there is to know about mankind. I prefer to leave that to the Almighty. If this person believes this necklace can absolve him or heal him, then he no doubt would sink to the law of pilfering, or worse. Thank you, Herr Busser. Herr Michael, 
before you go, I must again thank you for your kindness towards me. The pleasure is all mine. Are we ready to leave now? Yep, all set. Now, off you go. But before you do, may I advise traveling by boat on the Eel River? It will lead you directly to the church, and you can maintain your obscurity from the burghers' watchful eye. I plead at the mercy of the council to listen to me. Burgelbrandt, he is gone mad. It either be this dancing plague or the Wuller hunt. But what he did yesterday was cruel and unusual. Even for him. Be mindful of your tongue, Herr Mueller. You know better than to speak such accusations. What on earth could he have done to prompt you to consider him mad? He had my wife hanged. No trial, no warning, no nothing. They just strung her up and let her fall. Your wife was ill with a dancing fever, yes? She was. A mercy killing, I'm sure. Hear, hear. Burger Brat did what he knew was best for her. He always knows what our people need. A mercy killing, was it now? Can either of you tell me what mercy is? Is it hanging an innocent woman by a rope, kicking her off a platform and watching her fall and hearing her neck snap like a twig? Are you quite finished? If so, we would appreciate your leaving the premises. I don't know why I came here. But I would like to thank you for helping me see the light. Hell, Michael is not the monster I thought he was, nor is he even a monster. He is not my enemy. You are. you think we're doing the right thing? Uh, yeah, I guess. If I knew what you were talking about, that is. <laughs> By returning this necklace to the church. After all, we are in the business of stealing historical relics, not reinstating them. Not to mention, this is the exact necklace Isaac is wanting. And who said we would be returning it? Um, you did, sorta. Before we left Dr. Monet's house, you said we needed to bring it to a priest, Johannes, at the Strasbourg Cathedral, because Martin told you it contained blood with healing powers. I only framed it that way because I didn't want Martin to hear my actual plan, but I think he may have been on to a cure-all for the dancing plague. I don't know if this blood has the ability to heal or not, but if it does... I get it. So, we go see this priest, show him the necklace, and convince him to use it on the dancing zombies? Mm-hmm. And then we'll find Hart and James and get the heck out of here. But what about Isaac? We were unsuccessful in locating the necklace. Right. And if the blood isn't a remedy? Well, then we'll search for Hart and James and get the heck out of here with the necklace. When we made it to the port, we'll dock and then we'll walk to the church. It's only about a mile from here. Aye, aye, Captain. All right. That should do her. Ready? <sighs> Ready. This is the most gorgeous church I have ever stepped foot in. <laughs> Daphne, this is the only church you've ever stepped foot in. <laughs> it's 
still. Its beauty is bringing tears to my eyes. And do you hear that? It sounds like a clock ticking, and I didn't even know churches had clocks inside them. That is no ordinary clock, madame. That is an astronomy clock. You'll find it more useful for keeping a record of the lining of the stars than you will time. Uh, you must be Priest Johans? At your service. And you are... Uh, I'm Michael, and this is my wife, Daphne. We're theologians and friends of Friar Booser. Friends of Booser? There's a frightening thought. If he has sent you to procure ceremonial oil, then he has sadly mistaken. Uh, n n no, no, nothing like that, though he did recommend we see you. Do you know anything about the legend attached to this necklace? The friar didn't go into much detail, but he said you could tell us everything we needed to know. Quite well, actually. But first, tell me what you know. What has Booser told you about it? Well, he told me the necklace was from when he was a monk and that well, all the monks had one. And that the necklace contains a little vial of blood, which apparently possesses healing powers. Ah, yes. The blood of St. Vitus. Please, take a seat. <clears throat> Have either of you ever heard the story of St. Vitus? No. No. St. Vitus was born in Sicily in 290, in the small village of Mazara del Vallo. His father despised his faith in Christ, but Vitus was relentless and he rebelled. He fled with his tutor to Lusania, where his troubles would really begin. Emperor Diocletian's son had been possessed by a demon, and Vitus was called upon to exorcise the demon. This proved successful, but the boy still proclaimed Christ. So Vitus and his tutors were tortured until death. Vitus was boiled alive because of his faith, but it wasn't over. He survived his torture for three days at least. Many say he lived because his faith in Christ never faltered, but what they forget is he had been praying with this necklace in his hands when the Romans came and put him in the pot. He was only 12 years old. How did his blood wind up in the necklaces then? Uh, legend has it, uh, when word that St. Vitus had survived such monstrosity, the Pope himself had requested the blood be let from his body as the blood seemed to possess healing abilities. Do any of your parish members believe in the legend of St. Vetus's blood? There are many factions within the church who believe it, yes. One of my parishioners, a young man, became obsessed with it. He wanted to learn more about it and became so determined to find the necklace to the point where I had to ask him to leave this parish until he relieved himself of such foolish delirium. And this uh, disillusioned parishioner... Who was he? Xavier Duhart. Isaac, we need to talk. Mr. Gleason, to what do I owe the pleasure of this unscheduled consultation? I assume you know why I'm here. I never assume, Mr. Gleason. In fact, I'm quite sure you are here to either ask me about missing clothing or what seems to be wrong with the machine. To answer both questions, it would be our Shadow Squad. Now you're going to ask what that is and why I failed to inform you about them. And my failure to acquire your approval to use the machine. Um, well, yes. We could have avoided a tremendous amount of confusion and downtime with the machine if I had known what was going on. For months, I have been talking about the machine acting funny and putting in many hours to try and keep it functional. Which is why I had to streamline the process. While I would have waited for your approval, an anomaly that required my immediate attention came up. 
you must remember, Murphy's Incorporated will not be held accountable for time paradoxes. However, we will not allow our subordinates to cause them either. What anomaly? What is this Shadow Squad? I have been in Murphy's employment for longer than you, and it has never been mentioned before. Up until now, only the Chief and I were privy to the details of the Shadow Squad. Due to your work out of class status, you now have full access to all departments and their resources. I have always had full access to everything. Murphy has never hidden anything from me. <sighs> Unless it were absolutely necessary to avoid an issue with the timeline. I want all files regarding this Shadow Squad, a detailed outline of all department heads, their subordinates, and their duties immediately. The documents that you have requested, along with the detailed itinerary and backlog of Shadow Squad's findings, have been sent to your tablet. Thank you. You've authorized multiple jumps with my machine? How dare you? How did you gain access? I am almost always with it. There is no way you could have done this much without me knowing. Without my presence, something catastrophic could have happened. Your machine? Mr. Gleason, please do not mistake your personal possessions with the sole property of Murphy's Incorporated. Enough! Moving forward, you will not make any moves outside of paying the bills without my express knowledge and approval. Expect a note of defiance to be added to your personnel record by the end of today. Understood. Oh, where are my manners? You have been here for quite some time and I haven't offered you any refreshment. That is not necessary, nor is this... From the Eleanor itself, 1773, Boston, Massachusetts. It was confiscated from one of your previous interns during their debrief after a mission. You see, it wasn't on the list of items to be retrieved that day. Therefore, it is contraband. The intern implied that they were assigned this task by Daphne. When we questioned her... She responded with, they weren't going to use it anyway. <laughs> well, uh, Daphne is known to uh, procure a few extra items on missions from time to time. I don't see what the harm is. I'm sure it wouldn't have had any effect on the timeline. No, there is no harm in trivial matters when approved. This leads me to ask... If you approved of this extracurricular excursion, Mr. Gleason, and if so, why haven't the logs been forwarded for filing? I will talk to Daphne when she returns. And what about this anomaly you mentioned earlier? Good, and I will expect to see her note of defiance alongside mine by the end of the day. Wait, what are you talking about? Please see yourself out, as I must take this call. Do enjoy the tea. Was Xavier sick or injured? Not physically, Madam Daphne, though spiritually, he is unwell. You see, legend has it, St. Vitus' blood can not only heal physical detriments, but spiritual ones as well. I, I'm sorry, Father, but I don't understand Absolution. What... It can absolve someone of their sins. What would this Xavier Duhart need to be absolved of? If only I could know the answer to that. He appeared one day and took confession with Father Robert. Afterward, I saw him leaving, and I noticed he looked upset. Did Father Robert ever tell you what Xavier had confessed? Unfortunately, confession is kept completely secret. Even if I had wanted to pluck the truth from Father Robert, I could not. He, too, became ill with the dancing and died nearly a week ago. He came down with a plague just like that? Candidly, Herr Michael, I didn't see him dancing until after a basket of bread had been delivered. Father Robert had gone to take communion with the bread and started dancing soon after. Do 
all of your congregation members partake in communion? It is required of all members. Do you know how many parishioners partook in communion after the bread was delivered? I don't know the exact figures, but in my estimations, I'd say all of them, except one. Josephine, James, we've arrived at the cathedral. Huh. And in one piece, too. Xavier, it's the most charming, magnificent sight I've ever laid eyes on. It is, isn't it? I'm sorry to interrupt your tour, but this little game of yours has come to an end. You... God, seize them. No! Let's go with me! Unhand them! At what? Ah, oh, look who we have here. Xavier, my old friend. So good to see you. I've Do you hear that? Sounds like someone is screaming for their life outside the church doors. It does. Come on, let's go check it out. Oh my gosh, is that Hart and James? Michael? Daphne? Is that... is that you? Well, well, if it isn't this Herr Michael I've heard so much about, seize them. Thank you, Father Johannes, for rounding up the last of them. You shall be rewarded greatly for your contributions. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Your Grace. I shall never forget your kindness. Backstabbing bastard. Now, where were we? Oh, yes, guards. Take them to the Maison d'Arrêt where they shall be detained until their trial is to start. Yes, Your Grace. Michael, what are we going to do? I'm going to get us out of this, I promise. What? What now? I have something here in my pocket that will interest you. It's yours only if you agree to release my friends and myself and clear us of these Seder charges. Josephine, no! What are you doing? Saving us. Hmm. Deal. The cadeau de l'au-delà. Priceless. As precious as gold or silver. Powerful enough to enthrone me over all the empire. Detain them. The stakes await them on the mall. We had a deal! My dear child, were you not taught to distrust serpents? For their tongues are formed. This is it. We're gonna die. We're gonna die. We're gonna Pull die. yourself together. Michael has a plan, don't you? Mm hmm. Joy! What do we get to discuss today? Sex? Drugs? How about rock and roll? We should get back to discussing your employees. I will let you choose who we talk about. Well, if that's the case, I say we talk about Hart. Hart? Oh yes, Josephine, correct? I would advise not calling her that to her face. She prefers to be called Hart. Noted. She seems very important to your organization. Everyone on my team plays a vital role, but Hart is on another level and can be called on to cover just about any section in operations. Please explain. How about some backstory to start with? Agreed. I was looking at my current staffing and realized that some changes would need to be made in the next number of years. My team was getting rebellious, making decisions without involving me, selling items they would obtain for their own profits, and just general insubordination. I thought we were going to talk about Josephine. I imagine your kind are not good storytellers. Anyways, I became aware of Josephine Hart when she was 16. I was planning for a future head forger, while looking at art schools, one of my agents came across her work. She could create almost perfect recreations of Leonardo da Vinci's Mona Lisa, Vincent van Gogh's Starry Night, and even 
made a miniature of Michelangelo's David out of marble. Because I didn't need her right away, I knew this would be a great opportunity to shape her life in a direction that would benefit me. What exactly do you mean? How did you shape her life, and how did she eventually come to work for you? Ultimately, some would say that I did both through some nefarious means. So trickery? Not trickery, per se. More like clever planning. It did involve crushing dreams. Seems like that might be below you. Does it? It does, but please do explain. When Hart was applying to universities, I had to get her denied from a couple of art schools that were at the top of her list. She ended up having to go to a lesser school, which would be the same school I was sending Daphne to. The next step, and probably the easiest, was to fix it so they would be roommates. Interesting. By that time, Daphne's English was so good you wouldn't have known she was born in Korea. She also pushed herself to learn about history and was able to blend in to her new time period. I was able to have Daphne do some light interning for me, and I knew she wouldn't be able to resist telling someone. It took a little longer than I would have liked for the two of them to grow close enough, but finally, they tried to sneak into the past by bribing Gleason. Upon their return, I was waiting for them, and knew Hart would be hooked. I also made her a deal she couldn't resist. What kind of deal? I told her that I would cover the cost of the rest of her schooling, and then she would come to work for me for five years. And she's been with me ever since. We find your tactics questionable. I get results. Was Daphne in on your plan all along? No, 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 no. I care about Daphne more than anything else, but even with her, I keep things close to the chest. And how do you suppose Hart and Daphne would feel to find out that their friendship was a sham, all for your benefit? I don't ever intend on telling them. And anyone who might have any knowledge of the situation is no longer with us. You should spend more time on inward reflection. I will tell you there is coming a time when you will have to reconcile these transgressions with the people you've committed them against. This episode was written by Ashley Dean, James Devro Lewis, Tyrus Rayner, and Mark Helton. Directed by James Devro Lewis. Produced by Mark Helton, James Devro Lewis, and Tara Eon. Audio editing and effects by Joe Bly with Kiana Music. Original music by Louis Palfrey. Original artwork by Lawrence and Diego Iriarte. This episode featured the voice talents of Kirsty Harrison as Murphy, Jenny Helton as Daphne, Shandon Loring as Michael, Mark C. Helton as Gleason and Dr. Monet, Tyrus Rayner as Isaac, Carrie Hampton as Hart, Quinn Caffarata Jenkins as Philippe, Kaz Chandler as The Librarian, Stephanie Bauman as Intern 1, James Devereaux Lewis as Intern 2, Caitlin Cole as Autumn, with Anita Kelly as Sylvia, Michelle Calhoun as The Interrogator, Remy Savard as Sebastian Brandt, Cassandra as Shadow Leader, Spencer Stoner as Martin Booser, Angel Kabarlock as Xavier Duhart, Brian Murphy as Priest Johannes, Nicole Shader as Greta Duhart, C.R. Edwards as The Guard, Frank Riley as Burger Number One, R. Mike Kelly as Burger Number Two, Greg Zemma as Bruno Muller, and I'm Connor Howard, your announcer. This series is developed and proudly produced by 97 to Now Productions. For more information about the show, please visit our website. Tune in next time as Murphy's Inc. continues. <laughs>